welcome everyone to our uh, subspecialty grand rounds. Uh, we're very excited to have Jason in the back and Dr. Mushfar in the back uh, to provide some cornea expertise as, where, as well uh, as our presenter. I don't want to forget Joe Hatch, who is the original cornea surgeon of the Intermountain West as well, who's in the room. Uh, so a big thanks to Carl. Uh, Carl is a current cornea fellow. Uh, he came to us uh, via medical school and Dre at Drexel University and then uh, did his residency in New York. Uh, what I like to say is in Jamaica in New York, and he can explain what that actually means. Uh, but again, we'd like to uh, thank Dr. Moshfar again for helping get these cases together. Uh, yes, Jamaica was an interesting place. I'd like to uh, thank everyone. Uh, for allowing me to be here this morning. I'd like to present intriguing corneal cases. I'd like to thank Dr. Moshefar for providing these for us. And uh, I thought I'd start with two more simple cases that we can have a little discussion about. And then a third one that's more of an interactive case that's a little longer and a little more interesting. So the first case is um, a 63-year-old female who presented originally to Dr. Bernstein with headaches and poor vision in the left eye. And uh, she has a past medical history of non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, asthma, depression, and, and migraine. And she has no past surgical history, no trauma, and no real known or unknown conditions of the eye in her family. And really no m ocular history in the past. She really has had a couple of eye exams with optometrists, but nothing significant in her history. Her vision was 20-20 in the right eye. Uh, 2250 in the left eye, and uh, four millimeter pupils, no APV, uh, full EOMs, full visual fields, normal pressures, uh, normal lids, lashes, white and quiet. Um, interesting, interestingly enough, she had full stromal thickness, well delineated ring shaped opacities in both of her corneas, and um, these didn't involve the ep epithelium, decimase, or the endothelium and uh, we're pretty symmetric, about two to three millimeters in both eyes. And uh, deep and quiet, one to, one to two plus NS, one plus cortical in both eyes for cataracts. And uh, you know, her posterior exam was, was um, significant for a pretty large macular hole in the left eye, no subretinal fluid, but everything else posteriorly was normal. So you know, we saw her for this corneal finding, obviously there was a more important thing going on, which was the retinal hole. But, you know, this is what we initially saw. You can see that there's this central corneal ring right here. It's stromal. It's full thickness from anterior to posterior stroma. And um, kind of outlines the, uh, the pupil right here. Before we looked into that any further, she had a, a vitrectomy and ILM peel. She had C3, F8 gas placed. And uh, we did a cataract extraction with a posterior chamber intraocular lens. And then we kind of looked further into these strange corneal rings that we had never seen before. They're, this is the right eye. This is the left eye. You can see they're very symmetric, outline both pupils. Again, this is the right eye. You can see here the cross section of the rings that goes pretty much full thickness. It's hard to tell here whether it you know, really involves the epithelium and the, uh, the endothelium. Here again, you can see full thickness, stromal opacities. Here's a Visante anterior segment OCT. You can see with this cross section right here, again, you can see this hyperreflectivity right here that shows it goes, it doesn't involve the epithelium. You know, it's hard to say here whether it involves the endothelium, but we don't think so, or decimase membrane, but you can see these definite areas of the opacity right there. And she didn't have any history of elevated lipids. No antiarrhythmic, antimalarial, antirheumatic drug use, no deficiency in mucopolysaccharide or amino acids in the patient's family or herself. So, you know, we were trying to figure out th what this was because we had never seen anything like this before. And we looked in the literature. And, uh, you know, whenever we see any type of corneal opacities, we go through the differential. And obviously, like a Kaiser Fleischer ring um, is something that comes to mind, but this patient. Um, don't have Wilson's disease, juvenile arcus is a, po a possibility, you know, as she was younger, but much more peripheral. You know, we went through the dystrophies, something like central cloudy uh, dystrophy of uh, Fran Francois or, or Chagrin, but, you know, these don't really look that like that at all, even those, c those can be central. 
Arcus furrodegeneration, Terran's marginal degeneration, these are all peripheral findings that can form sort of a ring shape, but you know, not high on our differential for this case. Herpetic discoform keratitis can be ring shaped, but looks completely different than this. And then you, know, you can think about immune rings, Coates rings, PUK, but you know, these, a lot of these are unilateral or at least asymmetric. And uh, with those two rings, they, they show some sort of nidus for that immune response or that immune infiltration. And when we looked into, into the literature, one of the main we saw was one by Mellis, who uh, in 1998 in the British Journal of Ophthalmology described a in a 25-year-old male. And this was a little bit different. It was eight millimeters in diameter. And, um, but this similarly had no medical or surgical history. Uh, that was pertinent, no involvement of Bowman's, Decimase, or endothelium. And um, he had some pretty extensive testing, uh, hematologic general medical testing, and they didn't really find anything for him. And simil similarly, he did not have any symptoms. He had no glare, no halo, no blurry vision. And this, we can see, is the larger 8 millimeter ring in this 25-year-old male that is pretty insignificant. You'd be surprised that that did cause some sort of glare, halo, or blurry vision. You know, kind of similar in the fact that it's symmetric and that the patient doesn't have any uh, reason to have it. They also described in that same article in 1998 that they had found five other cases where patients either had uh, a unilateral or a bilateral, three were unilateral, two were bilateral stromal rings that they didn't know why uh, they had this. There were no findings. They were all, it was hard for me to review that literature because it was all in German. I haven't brushed up on that in a while. Um, but, um, you know, there hasn't really been a lot in the literature, and we don't really know what this is, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to present it, um, to see if anybody else had any um, ideas of what this could be. We contacted a couple other corneal specialists from different universities, and they had noted they had seen things similar to this before, maybe a little larger, maybe a little bit smaller, um, bilateral, but they had not found any reason for these findings as well. And, you know, for this lady, She's 63, she has no symptoms, she has good vision, at least in the right eye, the left eye had the macular hole. Um, you know, should we put this lady through you know, a million dollar workup to try to figure out what this is, or should we just let things be and, and kind of let her live her life and monitor her, make sure things don't get worse? I don't know if anybody has any thoughts. Dr. Olson? Good point.
great point. Thank you. So we're not really sure. We know that she went to an optometrist two to three years before she had uh, been evaluated by Dr. Bernstein, and they had mentioned something to her. They didn't really uh, make a big deal of it. She wasn't referred anywhere else, but she knows that it had been around for a couple of years, but again, hadn't had an eye exam in 20, 30 years before that. between rings and high, high myopia. You know, I didn't come over anything like that in, in the literature, but that's a good point, so I'll have to take a look at that. Great, let's move along to case number two. This is a 73-year-old female who presented as a referral from an optometrist on, on the outside at, uh, for just a corneal opacity and multiple corneal opacities, and um, the patient was asymptomatic when she presented. She had 20-20 vision in both eyes, no APD, total EOMs, normal visual fields, normal pressures. And um, lids and lashes were normal, white and quiet, cornea and uh, conge and sclera. And she had these numerous scattered and variably confluent uh, anterior stromal opacities in both eyes, uh, the left more than the right. Normal iris, normal anterior chamber lens, and fairly normal posterior exam as well. So this is the right eye. As you can see, she's nicely white and quiet. A little bit of uh, vasculature right there, but you can see these anterior stromal one to two millimeter here, opacities smaller here, but they're a little bit confluent. Um, kind of patches, kind of fluffy, maybe crystalline in the right eye. Left eye a little more significant, a little closer to the visual axis, more confluent, but that same fluffiness um, could almost call some of these satellite lesions uh, when you're looking at them. A nice cross section, you can really see how these stromal opacities are in the anterior stroma. This is a good example right here. So as far as these opacities, we know we're wondering exactly what they are. We don't have a great history on this lady. She's not a great historian. Um, could be infectious, unlikely, no injection, but um, could fungal has areas of fluffy white, has satellite lesions, but doesn't typically look like that. Herpetic, uh, maybe not an active infection, but oftentimes patients have these anterior stromal opacities that can be scattered across the cornea. Maybe a dystrophy, macular, granular, doesn't really look like it at all, but you've got to think about the dystrophies. Is it, could it be possibly be a lipid deposition or some sort of crystalline deposition? Or could there be, have been in the past some sort of chronic epithelial defect in both eyes? Um, you know, patients who have these epithelial defects over time, uh, if it stays that way, can develop these anterior stromal opacities. Usually it's more diffuse in one localized area and not as, as uh, scattered as that, but these are all possibilities. So we dug a little deeper and did find that the, out that the patient uh, had been seeing a hematologist and had had a recent diagnosis of monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, or MGUS. And this is a, a condition that involves 6% of the, pa uh, the uh, people in our population, uh, 60 to 80 years. And uh, it's a slight elevation of uh, monoclonal paraprotein. And these patients must have normal plasma cell counts because we need to rule out uh, multiple myeloma if they become elevated and they are transferred to that diagnosis, and it's thought to be a precursor of multiple myeloma. Uh, and the low percentages of 1 to 3 percent can trans, uh, further diagnosis from this to multiple myeloma every year. And um, these patients are yearly monitored with serum electrophoresis to specifically screen for that. What other hematologic disorders have corneal findings. Well, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, there's been some case reports. I've talked about circular superficial stromal infiltrates, 
some of them, there's been a couple in, in virgin corneas, a couple in actual grafts of patients who've had penetrating keratoplasties. But the most significant one that we see is in patients with multiple myeloma, where they have these crystalline, either anterior stromal crystalline deposits, or they can have copper deposits on Desimase membrane. And sometimes they're diffuse and central, and sometimes they can be peripheral and patchy. And um, the reason for this is they can have uh, hypercupremia uh, related to their multiple myeloma. They can also have uh, lens deposits, lens capsule deposits as well. Um, also, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia can have a, a keratoconjunctivitis, but not necessarily deposits a stroma. This is an example of uh, the crystalline deposits in multiple myeloma. It looks similar to our patient, but um, not as patchy, not as fluffy, um, much more crystalline as I was describing. You know, so what should we do for this patient? Um, the vast majority of these patients are not treated for their problem. They have an a slight elevation, they're monitored by serum electrophoresis, but they're not given any treatment. And, and in fact, it can be pretty toxic at times, depending on which one is used. So generally, no treatment is necessary. They're generally asymptomatic. And, and for this lady, you know, even though she had an area in the left eye that was kind of encroaching on the visual axis, she did not complain of any glare, halo, or blurry vision. So um, I think that for her monitoring progression of these deposits, and also, you know, it would have to be a discussion between the ophthalmologist and the hematologist if it did become a problem, whether systemic treatment might be an issue. Because in patients who have multiple myeloma and have these findings, there's regression of the corneal findings when the systemic disease is treated. Any questions or comments? Yes, Dr. Wilson. So, uh, all these patients who have a, a monotone spike, uh, I mean, uh, the treatment is indexed as, as uh, if you talk about multiple myeloma. It, it's really the, the, the organ that gets hit the hardest on treatment. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, it gets easier and gets less. So, it's interesting because the perspective. a great point yeah and you know maybe you could by um, alerting you know whoever's taking care of that patient systemically you could uh, prevent them from going having to have dialysis because maybe you catch them going right into renal failure so you know something that we can really help the patients with other than the uh, the ophthalmic findings okay so this is a little bit more in depth and I'd like a little bit of interaction with this um, this is a 67-year-old male who presented at the Moran Eye Center for worsening vision, um, the right a little worse than the left, who has a history of hypertension, hypercorrhythmia, and he had a pretty extensive ocular surgical history, LASIK in both eyes 15 years before presentation, uh, an enhancement in the right eye only about seven years before presentation. He had a single intact placed in the left eye three years before presentation. Then he had conductive keratoplasty two years before presentation in both eyes. And then he had a posterior chamber intraocular lens in the right eye, one and a half presentation. Um, so, you know, we didn't have a lot of details on a lot of the back and forth between the surgeons and the patient um, for these, these surgeries and enhancements. But as you can tell, we have a certain type of patient population who 
demands perfect vision and, and, and wants continual treatment, and this is one of those types of people. Um, interestingly enough, the patient didn't have too much astigmatism on presentation, uh, about 2.25 in the right eye, 3.5 in the left, but the vision, regardless, was not great, 2070 in the right eye, 2050 in the left eye. You can understand why he's not happy, especially having all these procedures. So lids and lashes were normal, white and quiet, conscience clara. He had LASIK flaps, as we know, nasal hinges in both eyes, CK in both eyes, and the intacts in the left, as we discussed. Uh, PCIO on the right, 1 plus NS in the left. And um, pretty normal posterior segment, no macular findings that could explain why his vision is poor. So unfortunately, we didn't have any photos, but I thought these drawings would be very valuable and explaining what this corneas look like. So you can see in the right eye, they had a PCIOL and the nasal hinge here with the LASIK flap. And CK was done in both eyes superiorly, um, I guess in an attempt to try to steepen that area. There must have been a significant flattening. And then you can see the single intact segment here. This deposition is just cholesterol deposition that can happen uh, in the more central area of the intact. So the right eye, the topography shows definitely some significantly irregular astigmatism. You can see very steep area right here. Um, not tremendous, a tremendous amount, only 3.12, but definitely very irregular. Left eye is more, reg more regular. Understandable why his vision is better in the left eye. So, you know, what's our diagnosis? We diagnosed him with irregular astigmatism in the right eye is uh, some irregular astigmatism astigmatism in the left eye, but you know, what should we do in this situation? This patient comes to us, he's had all these surgeries before. Honestly, we'd rather not have to do another surgery on him because the options now are not great. He's not going to have 20-20 vision. And um, I don't know, so what, what does everyone think? What should we do first for this patient? That's a great point, yeah. And then if it doesn't work, we should probably try it again. <laughs> and then maybe even try, you know, a hybrid lens with a, a rigid center and a, and a peripheral skirt. Um, you know, that's a great point. So a rigid gas permeable lens, yep. You know, I listed a couple of other things that are possible on our list of surgical interventions, but, you know, something that we'd rather not do. Um, another single intact in that eye, an, an AK, astigmatic keratotomy, maybe a piggyback torque lens, but probably not. And you know, our last, our last line of defense is the penetrating keratoplasty. You know, um, some of these patients cannot tolerate these lenses, so that's you know the only other option. Now we'll t we'll just talk about the left eye real quickly here, but this is the last slide where we'll really address the left eye, since it was more regular. I think he maybe could have benefited from the astigmatic keratotomy. Or maybe even a, a cataract extraction with a torque intraocular lens in that eye. So yeah, we decided to do a, a rigid gas permeable contact lens, or maybe a synergized hybrid lens in that eye. And he did try once. He made a good effort, failed the trial of the lens. He had painful, uh, painful when the contact was in the eye. He had poor vision, and uh, you know the exam was very similar as, as to what it was when we saw him four months prior, or five months prior. Excuse me. Uh, a little bit, yeah. He did have some vision. He did have some improvement in his vision, but um, he could only keep it in for a brief period of time. He couldn't even make it out of the office with that contact lens in. So, he actually tried it again, which was nice. Um, tried a little bit different fitting, um, but failed a second time. So, you know, we decided that we would try a penetrating keratoplasty. We talked to him extensively that his vision may not improve. He might have this penetrating keratoplasty. He might have irregular astigmatism. He might have exactly the same problems that he's having right now, but he was extremely adamant in having another surgical procedure. So we decided to do a penetrating keratoplasty, eight millimeter graft in that right eye. And um, we used 16 interrupted 10 nylon sutures. And then we followed him for three and a half months and began taking out those sutures. We used our topography to guide us um, taking out the sutures at the steep axis every time. And by eight months, um, 
All the sutures were removed, but he had irregular astigmatism again. And a lot of it. 10.68. So we went from 3.1 something diopters of astigmatism to 10.68. And um, his visual acuity actually decreased to 27. On his manifest, he had 8.5 diopters of astigmatism. So, you know, this is a tremendous amount of astigmatism. You can see it here on the tuxedo rings, the shortening in the axis of the steepening. So, you know, again, does anybody have any ideas what we should do here? Do here? Dr. Olson. So, uh, <coughs> you know, I, I, I've seen this now on the open surgery, but you just, when you meet the bare image, there's something about these uh, surgical plastic surgery and molding surgical surgery. I just think that's peripheral anyway. It's on the horse, but even though he's taking a good physical exercise, you can't get through that thing. Right. The, the irregular base. Serious point. So, uh, I mean, that, yeah, compass an issue, but it's interesting how compass an issue until people realize that this may be the only option they have. And they get the virtual lab, and they can do all of a sudden they have to realize that this approach is extremely unusual in how it's going to be used. Uh, people like surgical options because it's our modern era, and they want to button the pedal. They don't want to tell us what to do. Exactly. Point. What do you think about doing larger graphs? I know we found that doing larger graphs, making the edges closer to the limbus, even though it increases the chances of rejection, actually decreases the chances of astigmatism in those patients. Well, theoretically, obviously, that's going to be the case because you're going to be, uh, you're going to have more internal rigidity. Uh, you may not need to tear things to fit their base, and then hopefully you won't tear it off far enough to create any sort of hole. Uh, you, you can get to a point where It's not a great situation. Thank you. 
excuse me. Thank you very much, Dr. Warner. Yeah. It was the, the degree of astigmatism, it was about 10 point, about 10, like 10.3 or 10.4 diopter. 
10, 10 point three or four diopters. It is working. That's a great point. You know, we'll talk about a couple of those those things in a second. That's also so one of the like things is the permanent decision in Europe is going to be quite dramatically. They are now starting to actually uh, put a treatment for rain, and they they try to put it in the center, and the center is showing the paddock at the same end. The idea is kind of build a trough there to try to create a little more regularity. So I can never trust all of it because it's experimental, but they they, they publish a few results, and, and it's all. Very interesting, thank you. All right, so that's, we have a lot of options now. A couple of them that I'm gonna talk about are astigmatic keratotomy, wedge resection, which you talked a little bit about, Dr. Hatch, LASIK, or PRK. And I know it sounds crazy, but um, depending on what modality you use, it's, they're viable options. So what about astigmatic keratotomy? Well, might be a good idea in this patient, has fairly regular astigmatism. The pros are you can actually do it at the slit lamp or a minor room, and it doesn't take that long for these uh, incisions to stabilize, about three to six weeks, sometimes longer, de depending on how large you make them. And uh, depending on which literature you read, you can use them to try to correct as large of an amount of astigmatism as 15 diopters. But the only problem is for patients who have penetrating keratoplasties, they're very unpredictable. And, you know, where do you make these incisions? Do you make them in the graft, you make them in the host, you make them in the graft host junction. So to show you a little bit about, about what I mean, if this is the axis of astigmatism right there, you can put them in the host, you can put them in the graft host junction. And this is a little more complicated. It's not simply creating a, uh, an incision with a guarded blade. We take these patients to the operating room and we open the epithelium with a 15 degree blade and then we actually spread the tissue to reopen those incisions with a, a .12 or a, or a Calibri or a Cohan, um, rather than just making another incision right in that area. Or you can do it in the graft. So what are the advantages and, and disadvantages of those th three modalities? So host, you know, no one really does this. It's, it's minimally effective compared to graft and, and graft host junction AKs. And, you know, the source of astigmatism is actually at the junction of the graft and the host, so you're really not addressing that at all. And Let's say you want to do another graft in the future and you have these AKs in the, in the peripheral host. Number one, you might actually uh, hinder yourself and you might actually have a problem with making the next, uh, with creating the, uh, the tree fine groove for the next uh, penetrating keratoplasty. Or it just might create more irregular astigmatism that you have to deal with that you can't really, it's, it's much more complex at that point. With what about the graft? Well, like I said, it's more effective than the host, but you can't really use traditional nomograms. Usually we look at incision length, incision depth, and the proximity of the incision to the central cornea to try to titrate the amount of astigmatism that we're gonna treat. But this doesn't really work. They've done a lot of studies, um, and they found that rather than by altering the incision parameters, the um, amount of reduction that people get is usually proportional to the amount of preoperative astigmatism. So patients with larger amount of preoperative astigmatism get numerically a larger amount of decrease of their astigmatism afterwards. There also have been reports of actually doing multiple graft AKs um, circumferentially and, and then at intervals 0.5 millimeters inside each other to get more of an effect. What about the graft host junction? I talked a little bit about the procedure that we use to do that. 
Um, and and this, the results for these are very similar to those of the graft. And um, like I said before, the length of the incision doesn't really correlate with the amount of astigmatism reduction that you get. And really what we try to do is we try to center our AKs around the axis of astigmatism. And a lot of times, and not necessarily 180 degrees apart, sometimes you have one axis here and one axis here, and, and we center them right around those areas. And I'll, I'll show an example of that in a second. Right here, you know, you have a much, you have very asymmetric amount of astigmatism. Well, you could argue that this, in both sides, it's about 180 degrees. We would make the incision smaller for that area and larger for that area. And if this was rotated over here, we'd make the incision here. What about femtosecond? That's a great point. Um, they're great for making really accurate length, depth, and, and curvature incisions, but like we just talked about, that doesn't really matter for these patients. So um, they've done some studies. They haven't really compared femtosecond versus manual, but as far as the reduction of astigmatism, they've been comparable. What about retrosection? So instead of actually making the incisions like AKs on the steep axis, for wedge resection, you make them at the flat axis. And um, the problem with these is they take a long time to stabilize and a long time to heal. Um, and you can actually titrate them. You get a, a diopter or two of correction for every 0.1 millimeter, millimeter of tissue removed. And um, they're nice because you can actually correct a larger amount of astigmatism. So let's say a patient has 10, 15, 20 diopters of astigmatism. 10's kind of the low end. You can use these if you don't think the AKs are really going to make a dent in that astigmatism. And uh, there's been different studies that have shown as much as 70% uh, astigmatism reduction when these have been used by themselves. So here's an example. You can see there's basically two incisions being made. The first one is more central, and it's perpendicular or maybe a little bit angular towards the periphery. And then the second incision and the distance from each other is depending on how much astigmatism you want to correct. It's angled towards the base of that first incision, and then you remove the tissue. Usually about three clock hours is the measurement that people use. And then you suture them together. Usually they're paired. What about LASIK? We'll talk briefly about that. People use microkeratomes for a long time to try to correct post-keratoplasty uh, astigmatism. But the problem was, as soon as you go over that grass hook junction, it throws everything out of whack. And a lot of times, the calculations from before were completely off. And they did these in two in staged procedures. They would do the incision with the blade first to create the flap, and then they would wait, and then they would do the treatment. Well, with femtosecond, you can actually just do it within the, within the graft. And some of what Dr. Moshe was talking about before, there's more and more people outside the United States are using topographical guidance of Exmer laser for this, and that would be a great option for these patients. Similar thing for PRK, topo-guided PRK for these patients. And the only issue for this is that there's a high risk of haze, so you got to make sure you use mitomycin C in these patients. Like, start it rolling? Um, I'll tell you, too, I don't know, but I would, I would think that, yes, it probably can make the cornea more susceptible to a rejection episode. Thank you. So I want to show that pre-AK top topography one more time. 10.68 diopters of astigmatism. You can see it's fairly regular, more inferior lengths than superior lengths. So the AKs were performed postoperatively two weeks, went from 10.68 to 7.79. It's a reduction, not tremendous. Five weeks. 8.09 diopters, a little bit higher. Three months, 7.89, kind of stabilizing high sevens, low eights. Still a large amount of astigmatism. 
Best corrected visual acuity, 2080, worse than when they started. Lower amount of astigmatism. Now it was 8.5 before the AK on the MR. Now it's 7.5, but not really what we're looking for. Dr. Wolf. Yeah. That's a great point, thanks, yeah. You know, I, I didn't mention it, but this was done at, in the seven millimeter optical zone. And uh, you know, obviously, uh, like you said, you get more uh, effect the further in you go, but they've done a lot of studies. And once you go within that five millimeter zone, you start, not only you start having issues with vision, but uh, their regular astigmatism can kind of go crazy, so. Just inside the graph, right? You don't yeah. All right, so what are, now what are we going to do? Does anybody have any ideas? Now we kind of threw out a lot of ideas already. Dr. Zong? That's a great point. Yeah. That's definitely an option here. So we could do it, the AK again and deepen and lengthen it. Sometimes you just can't go deep enough and long enough that you can really get the effect that you need. You can't go do more than 290 Yeah, so compression sutures are a great option. And you know, that involves the meridian 90 degrees away from where you're making these incisions. So that's, that's a great option. What about conductive keratoplasty? It has a similar effect as compression sutures. It steepens the cornea in that area. Or you could do some sort of combination of the two. So this is a different patient, but just kind of shows you uh, someone who intraoperatively is having AK as well as compression sutures 90 degrees away. And you can see here are the in graftose junction reopened incisions from the original keratoplasty. And here, other compression sutures, and you can actually see the striae. You want it to be tight. You want to see the striae. You want to have some fish mouthing um, of those incisions. The epithelium kind of moves in and allows it to stay and have that greater effect. Keratoplasty. Um, this is basically, for those of you don't, who don't know, thermal cautery that causes a controlled shrinkage of the collagen lamellae, steepening the cornea in that meridian. And uh, in general, it's used to treat low myopia. But as you saw with this patient initially, you can use it in focal areas to cause some sort of steepening um, for 
regular or irregular astigmatism. And this is generally the uh, positions th that people put the conductive keratoplasty um, spots for general hyperopia without correcting astigmatism. They usually put anywhere from 8 to 24 spots, a single spot for 8, and then the more you go up, the more correction you get. But for us, we didn't really want to cause a general uh, steeping. We wanted to cause a focal seeking. So we put six spots on each side in the area of the flattest meridian. And this is just a picture of that patient. I'll give you another view that so you can actually see. But here you can see the, the AK incisions within the graft. Thanks, Dr. Marshall. Yeah, Dr. Borowski. Um, when you talk about the peripheral So, like I said before, here are the AK incisions. And here, if you look closely, you can actually see the conductive capacity spots right there. And here. So here's a topography of the uh, seven days post-op period for this patient. And it's pretty amazing. Went to 2.11 diopters of astigmatism. You don't really see that regular astigmatism pattern in the 90 degree meridian. Fortunately, as time went by, post-op month one increased a little bit to 3.66 diopters. At that time, the visual acuity was 2060, which was better than before, which is it was 2080. Um, and you can see four diopters of, as of astigmatism on the MRX, which is significantly better than it was. Three months, increased a little bit more to 4.66. Similar best corrective visual acuity of 2060, 4.5 diopters of astigmatism. Five months, went to 5.19. Still 2060, and you know, if you're wondering, the graph is, graph is clear centrally, there's no gaping of the wounds, there's no other abnormalities here. So, you know, what do we do from here? We could repeat the AK, we could do additional CK, we could do compression sutures, maybe a piggyback. Toric IOL now that the astigmatism is more uh, more regular. What about a varicized lens? They have a, in Europe they have the foldable Veriflex toric lens. Or should we really go anywhere for this patient? I mean, we took this patient over a long period of time with many surgeries, many procedures from 2070 to 2060. Realistically, as we've been speaking, this patient's not going to get that much better, and it's a result of the peripheral cornea or, or whatever else is involved here. Um, so, you know, at this point for us, we, we've recommended and told the patient that there's not much else we can do for you, um, and we don't think it's a good idea. I mean, you never know what terrible things can happen if you keep going at this pace, and the vision could just, um, they could be 2200 or 2400, and, you know, at, at this point they should, they should, um, just try to, the contact lens again, see if that, helps them and um, unfortunately have to live with this type of vision. Any questions or comments?